Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. On today's show, the market for Chinese art is full of eye-popping figures, but is the outlook as rosy as it seems? We'll talk to an expert to see what the future holds. And later, the sweet sounds of Cremona. We'll introduce you to a family carrying on the centuries-old tradition of violin making. But first... That, for sure, we had a vision, we had a goals, and uh, we knew that we are going to be some kind of the engine for development, for uh, renewal of the Bosnian film industry. Mirsad Puri Batra, the director of the Sarajevo Film Festival, sits down with Showcase to talk about the past, present and future of the Balkan region's premier movie event. More than human exploring the seemingly endless artistic scenarios when it comes to artificial intelligence. As far back as antiquity, Greek myths incorporated the idea of intelligent robots, while more than 250 years ago, Hungarian author Wolfgang von Kempelen built a chess simulating automation. So, it should come as no surprise that London's Barbican Centre is exploring artificial intelligence through the ages, right up to the newest cutting-edge technologies. We sent our Miranda Atti to see what thinking machines spell for humanity. Can't find a dance partner of your own? Why not take to the dance floor with a robot? Or how about building the perfect city, optimized for living in? AI more than human considers the very specific ways artificial intelligence is already having a huge impact on our lives. The most surprising things for me and possibly the most beautiful things is um, where we explore this dream of AI and show that AI isn't something that's just happened in the last couple of years but it's a desire that people have had for centuries and centuries to create this intelligence that's, that's equal to human intelligence or beyond um, and it was really important for us to show that, that that's something that's always been there and, and that's something that's evolving as technology evolves. This is undoubtedly the most interactive exhibition I've ever been to. And each section is a reminder that AI is no longer the future, it's already here. We're in a room created by Team Lab, and here even the slightest movement can change everything we see. With this artwork, we would like to show, like, uh, a uh, relationship with people and the nature and the nature and the, uh, the elements uh, in the nature as well. So uh, maybe as you can see, there is a character falling down from the top. That the G's character represent a natural element. For example, water, uh, fire, uh, wind and then also some animals. Team Lab's creation highlights the concept that humans, nature and technology are all one. Every move we make influences the installation, making us part of a living simulation. Elsewhere in the exhibition, there are other learning machines. This artificial intelligence reads my facial expressions while I'm playing a computer game in order to record and process my dominant emotion. But for artist Anna Riddler, who created these tulips using AI, the technology is only a very small part of what we as humans can achieve. I think for a lot of time when people use AI, um, a lot of the kind of like decision making, a lot of the labour, a lot of this part is kind of hidden at the point of consumption. So this piece is really trying to open that up and really show the human aspect and the human decision making that sits in the heart of all of these algorithms. The Barbican's exhibition space is a bit of a sensory overload, full of whirring machines and automated voices, 
processing, analysing and regurgitating bits of information. Should we be afraid of AI? Well, perhaps. There are very few menacing robots on display here, but there are many different forms where AI analyses humans in order to replicate them digitally, which in the wrong hands could soon spiral out of control. If there's one thing to take away from AI more than human, it's simply that the future is uncertain. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Let's go now from the Barbican in London to the Balkans. Showcase continues its coverage from this year's Sarajevo Film Festival. Today, arts reporter Ali Jan Pamir sits down with founder and director Mirsad Purivatra, a highly respected name in the global cinema community. Purivatra has drawn the silver screen's major players to the region, beginning in the 1990s when Sarajevo was a city in ruins following years of civil war. His efforts have become a testament to the power of art to shape the future without forgetting the past. Mirsad Priwatra, thank you so much for joining us on the red carpet in front of the National Theatre. Pleasure to be here. Recently on our show, we had filmmaker Joe Dante as a guest, someone who I consider as an ambassador of cinema, actually. But you also uh, fit the description of an ambassador of film because you endangered your life back in the 1990s when the city of Sarajevo was under siege and you established the uh, city's festival. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about the atmosphere in which this festival was born? It was really unique uh, period in my life uh, under the bombardment with no water, with no gas, with no food. Uh, after several months, we found that maybe physically we can survive, but how to survive uh, mentally? How, what is this what is making human being? And then, then we found its culture. And then we went to create uh, something what could attract people to be together, to watch the art, to watch the films, then discuss the films, and it was big success. Really, we were so happy to see that people are reacting so well, that they are they're looking for art, they are looking, in spite of the risking their lives, to come to cinema to watch it. And then uh, what I remember is the most, uh, let's say, memorable thing in my life, that some guests at that time, 95, Alfonso Cuaron or Leo Carax, uh, did the Q&A after the film. And then it was not 30, 40 minutes. We stayed more than three hours because the people were so hungry to meet people from outside. And it was amazing to see that kind of the Q&A. Did you think in your heart back then that the Sarajevo Film Festival would eventually become this powerhouse cinematic celebration within the Balkan region? That, for sure, we had a vision, we had the goals, and uh, we knew that we are going to be some kind of the engine for development, for uh, renewal of the Bosnian film industry. And we are very happy to see what kind of the influence now we have. And it's great to see that citizens of Sarajevo, that whole industry from the region, from ex-Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, accepted Sarajevo to be the meeting place. And I think this is the biggest achievement. Now we are really creating initiatives, we are putting people in the network, and it's great to, to be here in Sarajevo. And how the festival ended up evolving into this influential industry platform? Uh, in the beginning, uh, it was clear for us that uh, our aim is not only to be showcased, just to present the film. We immediately told we need authors to discuss the films. Then we found we would like to be platform for development of the local and the regional cinematography. And then 15 years ago, we established uh, our industry platform called CineLink, and we learned a lot from Rotterdam, from Berlin. We send our people there to be trained, to, to, to see how to do it. And now today we are very happy to be among two or three, the biggest market uh, in Europe. I'm especially interested in two segments of the Sarajevo Film Festival, one of them being the student uh, competition section, and the other one uh, being the festival's uh, road to Oscar route, so to speak. 
How did you devise these segments and how did you get around realizing them? Yeah, for, for Sarajevo Film Festival uh, is uh, very clear that we cannot compete with uh, big industries as uh, France with the Cannes, uh, Germany with Berlin or Italy with, uh, with uh, Venice. Uh, we are aware that we can play on the different way and that's the reason why our concept is very simple. We play on the role of the festival which is uh, discovering, which is uh, supporting and which is uh, promoting new voices, new talents from the region. That's the way how we are trying to link them with us. It's great to see students, to track them from Students Day to hopefully Cannes Film Festival, to Oscar. And that's the reason why we established also so strong relation with the Academy that we can uh, 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 promote young talents from this region on the way that the winner is going directly to pre-nomination to Oscar. They don't need to distribute film in America, they, we are cutting one step for them. And this is our support to them for their careers and for young talents from the region. Let's talk about the 25th edition of the Sarajevo Film Festival. Could you please share with us uh, the message and the themes of this year's edition? We have very, I would say, uh, a fixed structure. That means we have a from one side programming, then industry, we have training, that's Sarajevo talents. But in the programming, we have a competition programs for feature, short films, documentaries, uh, students' films, and it's always based on the region. The region is Southeast Europe. And it's great that we have 20 countries and so good uh, films, and it's a really privilege to be the center of the region. On the other side, we have specialized, uh, several specialized programs as Human Rights Day. We have a uh, dealing with the past. Uh, uh, this is the program where we are presenting the films very related to our uh, uh, war 25 years ago, what we can learn from this. Uh, then we have a children program. We have uh, several specialized program, and I think that's what is uh, 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 great for festival, that you can find films for yourself, from children to intellectuals, uh, to fun films, uh, to serious films, to drama, to action. And I think that's the, the, the privilege uh, for all of us who are selecting that we can very wide uh, uh, scale of films. How does the festival help improve the local filmmaking industry? I think that festival uh, uh, initiated a lot of activities in the previous uh, 25 years. And now, uh, for example, the foundation for film is uh, established according to initiative of the festival. And then together with the Association of Filmmakers uh, who helped on this idea, we got a stable fund. Now it's not big fund, but now we are going step forward. We are trying more money, we are trying a stable fund, we are trying investment in first feature film, investment in genre film, investment in different kinds of films. Let's support our production. Then on the other way we are now initiating and hopefully the Canton Sarajevo will issue very soon a press release about a new tax rebate, about in, uh, uh, incentives. We would like to see a lot of international co-productions here and productions to invest money in Sarajevo which offers fantastic locations. That's the way. Then we are trying to link uh, uh, different stakeholders. We consider ourselves as a strong platform to put people together. What does the future hold for the Sarajevo Film Festival? I think that uh, we have a very stable way. We are never going to radical changes. We are going to be every year stronger and stronger. What could be uh, the next step? I think that we would like to see a uh, stronger Bosnian film industry. We would like to see stronger link between Bosnian film industry with the region and with the rest of the Europe. And we would like to see uh, CineLink uh, as our industry platform, uh, providing the best films from the World's Festival and also for Sarajevo. Mirsad Priwatra, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be guest of TRT World. Still to come on Showcase, a visit to the city of violence. We'll take you to Cremona, the Italian city where people from around the world flock to to learn the centuries-old art of violin making. But first, if these walls could speak, let's take a look at what's really happening to China's position in the global art market.
Less than two decades ago, China accounted for about 1% of global art sales. A decade later, it became one of the largest markets for art on the planet. And since then, China has proved itself to be a global consumer, along with the United States and the United Kingdom. But a report released in March is pointing to a not-so-bright future. The European Fine Art Foundation says that when it comes to the art business in China, the country should proceed with caution. They found Chinese collectors have developed a strong desire for international contemporary art, which in turn has pushed Western galleries to target China through art fairs and new permanent collections. The foundation says that this could push out many Chinese-owned galleries. The report also claims that because of the country's tax policies, it's possible more than a thousand private museums might have to either liquidate their collections or donate them to the state. To tell us about whether or not China's art market's rise was a short-term event, art consultant Mark Slats joins me now. He specializes in Asian art and antiques. Hi, Mark. So China became the second largest art market after the US in a very quick time. We just mentioned that. Does it still continue to grow? Um, we believe that recently, in the last couple of uh, years, we've seen a slight decline in, uh, in the growth in the Chinese art market. Um, however, it's, it's declining growth. Uh, we believe in the long run, the only way is, the only way is still up. The market will in, in continue to, to grow. Um, we will see disposable income increase for the middle class and the, and the upper class, which they, to some extent, will invest in works of art. Of course, we've seen some economic and political um, turmoil, which is maybe dampening growth at the moment. But in the long run, we definitely see a lot of potential for growth. And um, we got two recent reports saying two completely different things, actually. The Art Basel and UBS Global Art Market Report forecasts Asia's overall share of global sales to increase. But this TEFOF report that we um, mentioned earlier says that Chinese art markets' best days may already be gone. What do you say to that? What does the future hold? The market is maturing. The um, uh, clients are becoming more selective in what they want to buy. Some of the speculation that we saw in previous years with a, um, a complete peak in 2011 has left the market. Speculation is gone. Uh, clients are buying what they like and what they think will keep value. They're far more selective. Um, so do I believe that what Artnet called the juggernaut of the Chinese art market is gone? Yes, it probably is. But is that necessarily a bad thing? Probably not. So this report also says that the boom inspired Western galleries to turn to China, which could actually starve many Chinese contemporary art galleries. Do you think this is likely to happen? I think at the moment we're actually seeing a retreating of Western galleries from China due to the, uh, the trade war and the economic uh, political uh, problems we are seeing. In the long run, I think they, they will return, obviously. Um, what we're seeing is more competition. Increased competition is only good. It means that it, it, there's a kind of natural selection going on. So strong galleries, be it Western or be it Chinese, they will survive if they have the right uh, artists that are making quality artworks that are in demand and that fit with what clients want at the moment. So again, in the end, we'll end up with a, a marketplace that is maybe doesn't have the number of galleries, but where quality is actually far higher. So Mark, you just said that the, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing that Chinese art market is declining at the moment. Why did you say that? What does it mean? Um, I don't think the Chinese art market is declining. I think growth is declining. I think there's still growth, but um, growth that's out of control and that's actually based on speculation is, is never a good thing. It's not a good thing in, um, in a stock market. It's not a good thing in a property market. Instead, sustained growth um, is something that, in the end, it, you can build on. It's something that is that is stable. So I rather see you know four or five percent healthy growth than double digit, where the growth is actually based on on a bubble. Because at some point that air is going to get you know going to go out of the bubble. Unfortunately, we'll leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you very much. Now, let's go to a small city in the poor valley of northern Italy that has been churning out world-class violence for 500 years. 
famous for his coveted Stradivarius violence, which can fetch up to $16 million, the 17th century luthier Antonio Stradivari set a standard for handcrafted stringed instruments that many local artisans continue to emulate to this day. Forty-six-year-old Stefano Conia is sculpting a piece of wood in a cozy workshop he shares with his father, Stefano Conia Sr., a Hungarian artisan who migrated to Cremonia to study at the International School of Violin Making with the famous teacher Giobata Marassi. Stefano Jr. says the process and materials he and his father use are time-honored. The special characteristics of the violin built in Cremona is that it follows the Cremonese tradition, which is the one on which we base our work, the one that was created by Stradivari and by the families of Amati and Guarneri. We use the same type of processing. The feature that makes us unique is that we work everything by hand. We also follow the same kind of tradition of materials. Cremonese artisans use spruce wood for a superior sound, while maple, sourced from the dense Balkan forest from Romania to Slovenia, is used to craft the most important part of the violin. The first important phase is the construction of the bands, which are the central part of the instrument, the part that gives the thickness. After building the bands, you can do the outline of the table and the bottom. Once the external parts of the violin are finished and the remaining parts of the case are built and glued together, with the head and blooms added, the most time-consuming part of the work begins. Una volta che è pronta la testa con la tastiera. Painting requires a month of work because we give a hand a day for 30 days, so there are 30 hands. The thickness of paint will be a tenth and a half, two tenths at the most. After, it will proceed to the final setting by putting the sole, the accessories, the ropes, and the bridge. In the olden days, it was common for luthiers to use the intestines of sheep to produce strings. But this, like many elements of the craft, is changing. The gut string has the drawback that with humidity, warmth and seasonal changes, it does not hold the tuning. It can be lengthened and narrowed depending on the humidity. Of course, those cords are very well done. Today, the ropes are not only in gut or steel, but also synthetic. Today, at least 150 ateliers are keeping the city's tradition alive. Visitors can experience some of the earliest pieces at a special museum near the Palazzo Mina Bolzesi. Albeit originally from Hungary, the Konia family are adding their own thumbprint to the Cremonese legacy. La tradizione liutaria è un po in the violin making of Cremona, there are several families of violin makers for three generations, as in our case. We hope that the fourth generation, the children of my son, will continue. Now they are still too young, but you never know.
We've come to the end of another episode of Showcase. Make sure to join us next time for more of our coverage of the global art scene. In the meantime, you can find lots of other great showcase stories on our YouTube channel. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. <laughs>